Lecture 15, real-time scheduling. Okay, so it's been a while since we introduced it, um, but we started very early on, like in the course introduction, talking about the idea um, of a real-time system, just as kind of like a brief introduction. Um, and the thing that we said uh, that differentiated um, a real-time system from a non-real-time system has to do with wall clock time and effectively whether or not that matters. Um, if wall clock time is important, um, then we are talking about a real-time system. Um, and wall clock time being important implies the existence of deadlines. <clears throat> deadlines, <clears throat> moreover, only mean something if there are consequences for missing those deadlines, right? Um, if if there's no consequences for, for missing a deadline, like what what is its purpose, right? Um, it it kind of doesn't make sense. Um, so yeah, we should expect actually that um, well, um, deadlines are an important part of understanding real time scheduling. Um, and I mean, real time scheduling is to a certain extent just scheduling for real time systems. Um, and real-time systems don't necessarily behave the ways that we would normally expect, right? One of the things that we usually like is, oh, we, we want things to be fast. We say, all right, it's important that um, you know, the uh, program execute as quickly as possible. Um, maybe, right? Um, for a real-time system, maybe fast isn't desirable. Maybe all we really care about is predictable. There's kind of nothing wrong with that, right? So predictable is an important aspect of uh, many things uh, in situations that you've encountered in real life, um, you know, onboard computer system in your car um, or uh, on a plane if you fly in one. Like all of those things have certain deadlines and uh, missing those deadlines has consequences. Okay, so I want to talk about terminology just for a minute. And we use the term task to refer to something that needs doing. When we talk about real-time systems, we talk about tasks and uh, all of those things um, are kind of a um, proxy, if you will, for the fact that like what we're really talking about is like, yes, the scheduler is operating on thread, um, but um, let's say that every task corresponds to a thread, so we have sort of a one-to-one -one relationship um, in this case. Um, and we say like a task has a certain deadline, okay, that's fine. Um, that is to say we are trying to accomplish um, whatever the objective is and you know, respond to this request before um, the time has expired. And it is associated with a thread. Um, and so when I say the system schedules a task for completion, I want you to understand that to mean um, that it schedules the thread that is associated with that task. Whether or not um, every task has its own dedicated thread, or you can create them and destroy them and, and you can you know, reallocate them and have thread pools and stuff like that, those are beyond the scope of the course. Just imagine we have tasks and they are associated in some way with a thread. Uh, and when I talk about scheduling the task, what I actually mean is we will schedule the thread that is associated with the task such that the task will complete. Okay, uh, and there are some kinds of tasks, silken, soft, sprouted, firm, extra firm. Okay, no, that's, that's not quite correct. Um, those are types of tofu as opposed to types of task. Um, no, but tasks do come in uh, a few different varieties um, and soft and firm are two of them. So, you know, we're, we're getting there. Um, and um, we'll actually um, dig into it just a little bit. So a hard real-time task um, is one in which there is a deadline. The deadline must be met to prevent an error, prevent some damage to the system, or for the answer to make sense. Uh, and as you already heard me say, if we're attempting to calculate the position of an incoming missile, um, then a late answer is no good. Uh, if you know, we are not solving the problem it's, or fast enough, it's not good enough. Right? Um, a soft real-time task uh, has a less strict deadline in the sense that the consequences are not as severe if we don't miss them. Um, if we miss the deadline on a soft real-time task, it degrades the quality of the response, but it doesn't mean that it's useless. Um, and that's 
okay, right? Um, that if you're looking for, I don't know, like weather forecast or something and you know, your weather forecast data arrives late, like, yeah, you know, it tells you it's going to rain soon, but um, yeah, it's already started raining. And the answer isn't, isn't wrong, but it's not as useful as it could have been. So, yeah. Um, and then there is um, a distinction in some of the literature between um, firm and hard real time. Uh, and effectively, the distinction that we are talking about here um, is about the severity of consequences. Um, a firm deadline is one in which the response is useless if it arrives a little bit too late, uh, whereas a hard deadline is one in which the system itself fails if it doesn't meet the deadline. Um, and if the I don't know, Mars rover is the kind of system that we're talking about, um, if it misses a deadline and it drives off a cliff to its theatrical style doom, that's a truly hard deadline. Um, if we are calculating the position of a satellite because we want to upload some data uh, and the answer for the you know, position of the satellite arrives too late, the location that we calculate isn't correct uh, and so we don't succeed in uh, communicating with the, uh, with the satellite. But the answer is you know, just useless, but nothing bad happens, right? We needed to transmit that data um, and um, you know, we, we wanted to um, we wanted to send it uh, and I presume we were sending it for a purpose uh, not not just for fun right um, but uh, nothing nothing terrible happens right um, there's no you know, crash there's no um, unexpected anything in this result like the uh, as I say the you know, Mars rover you know, driving itself off a cliff um, that would be that would be much worse. Um, so yeah, that's the distinction between hard and firm real time, um, right? We could just we could just try again um, if we needed. Right? Why not? Okay, uh, and a lot of what we talk about um, for desktop operating systems and uh, that sort of thing um, is just not suitable for a real time system. Um, it, un it is unfortunate, um, but also not surprising uh, to some extent, um, because such an operating system provides few, if any, guarantees about service. Um, if there are consequences for missing deadlines, then um, actually, yeah, you know, the, uh, the, the problem is, is bad uh, if we don't make that deadline. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, Windows promises you nothing in this regard. And I mean, that's honest, right? Uh, <laughs> okay, it's, it's almost honest, I should say. Um, there's, there's a Megadeth reference. Um, now, the Windows scheduler, and we can look at it in Task Manager if you want, you can see and you can like poke around in there and there's an option to like set the thing to um, real time. Um, but that's not really a real time system. Right, um, it's it doesn't actually do what you think it does. Um, we'll talk about how scheduling works in Windows later on, uh, and then we will um, be able to uh, evaluate uh, what the actual meaning of such a thing is. Um, but um, yeah, it is uh, it is not really real time. So we would normally say that this sort of thing isn't suitable, right? Um, Remember also something like um, Java, um, and we talked maybe earlier on about why this isn't necessarily a good idea um, for a real-time system. Um, and part of the reasoning behind that is, well, it's uh, got to stop the world garbage collector. So when the garbage collector wants to run, it can cease all program execution. Uh, and accordingly, it can like choose uh, you know, to run the garbage collector whenever it wants for as long as it wants. Um, and that's that's no good, right? Um, as far as as far as we're concerned, uh, for you know, actual predictable runtimes of your program, that's not right. So if we truly need it for real time operations, um, then uh, we're going to struggle in this regard. Um, that opens up actually kind of an interesting discussion, which is um, okay. So suppose that we want to have like a bounded time limit, right? How long does it take to run a system call? You, know, you can estimate how long it, it will be and you can measure 
Um, and even though it might be okay on average, like what is the worst case scenario? Right? Um, because frequently we care about what is the, the worst case scenario um, in a real time system. So you know, how, how long is it gonna take? There's a couple of other things that sort of um, that make it hard to estimate, right? Um, if we can't be sure that it's within some bounded time limit, that's very concerning because, you know, again, we are talking about something that is potentially a life or death situation, right? If this is a motor vehicle or industrial machinery, knowing the time limits um, is you know, not just nice to have, but it's critical and missing the deadline isn't oops, it's like a uh, you know, major lawsuit because somebody died. So yeah, we, we do not want that. Um, we most certainly would like to avoid that. Um, okay, so with that said, right, um, here are some possible reasons why a task could take an arbitrary amount of time. Right, um, it's it's part of what makes it difficult to predict. But like some some thoughts, one idea um, interrupts. Right, interrupts are supposed to be quick. Um, and um, if if you remember in EC two five two, I would hassle you about um, interrupts, uh, and I would say things like, well, you have to check to see if something is async signal safe. Um, otherwise, you shouldn't be using it in uh, an interrupt handler. But also, like interrupt handlers should be very quick. Uh, as, as much as they can be um, to prevent um, things from going wrong. But here's the thing, there's no enforcement of the rule. The only thing that stops you from like, using something that's not async signal safe uh, in a signal handler is uh, somebody told you don't do that and you remembered not to do that and you figured it was important to not do that, right? There's no, there's no enforcement mechanism. The compiler won't stop you. Um, the operating system won't stop you. Like when, when you're executing the program, uh, it's, it's gonna take as long as it takes, right? Um, and maybe you don't care, but maybe you do. Okay, so I mean, with that said, right, there are lots of other reasons why in a general purpose operating system, it's fairly hard to predict how long something is gonna take. Um, concurrency control mechanisms, great example, right? Um, when a thread is blocked on a mutex, there could be arbitrarily many threads ahead of it in the queue. Um, even if you use a queuing system that didn't have any risk of starvation, the wait to enter the critical section could be arbitrarily long. Finite, but arbitrarily long. Uh, and that might not be acceptable because you know, arbitrarily long might be too long for our liking. So, okay. It's fair to say, I think, based on this, that a real-time operating system is just different from a general purpose operating system. Uh, and our goals are different, the constraints are different, and our priorities are different. So a lot of the things that we've talked about thus far in terms of like scheduling algorithms are not really suitable for um, a real-time system. Uh, it's, it's just not, right? Um, and that's okay because, well, you know, as the saying goes, we can do this, we have the technology. Um, we have other forms of scheduling that will make it work. Um, and a lot, of, uh, a lot of the scenarios that we'll talk about, right, um, scheduling makes a difference as to whether or not we actually succeed in meeting all the deadlines. Uh, and that's why we have to use uh, appropriate scheduling algorithm. Okay, so if a task is um, gonna be scheduled as hard real time. There's two scenarios that we could think of immediately in which it might not complete before its deadline. Um, and the first one is that it's scheduled too late. You know, the assignment will take two hours and you start at one hour before the deadline. Um, and you know, in this case, you know, if there's no part marks, um, the system will just refuse, right? There's no sense in starting this task because we know that failure is certain. Um, that's not the dream, right? Uh, that's not usually what should happen, and uh, I hope that you uh, don't start your uh, don't start your assignments at the very last minute like that. But in principle, you could, um, but you will end up being kind of disappointed, I think, in the end. Right? But it's also possible to like realize that uh, you know, something is not possible because like the travel time to get there is too long, right? You want to go to uh, this event. Um, but you know, by the time you get there, the event will be over. Um, and in that case, there's no sense in scheduling this task because you're gonna miss the deadline uh, of being there. Uh, and 
I mean, that's not pleasant, um, but it is, it is life. Okay, the other scenario uh, in which um, things could actually um, succeed uh, or fail, depending on scheduling, has to do with, um, well, what happens um, when at the time of starting, completion was possible, but for whatever reason, other tasks with a higher priority have, have come about, it's no longer possible to meet the deadline. Right? At the time that we started, it was possible, but too many things came up, uh, and you know, now what? Right? Um, now so much time has passed, you know, we got distracted, we had to deal with these other things. Um, now, there's, now there's not enough time left to finish the task. Um, and again, that sort of thing can happen also sort of when you're traveling, which is you know, when you left, there was plenty of time, but they don't, I don't know, there was a big crash on Highway 401, uh, and now there's not enough time. It's like, well, what do we do about this? So, okay, right? Um, the previous slide had an interesting question here, which is like, could we have completed the task if we had scheduled it better? All right? In the first case, like you know, we started too late, there wasn't enough time in total remaining to complete it. Um, and yeah, what if we had started earlier? Um, I mean, I, uh, I gave advice at the beginning of the term about how it's important to you know, start on the um, labs and stuff earlier. And I think we've all probably been in the situation like cursing our past selves for not starting on something early. Uh, I recognize I live at a pretty extreme end of the spectrum, you know, trying to do things like I want to have all the lecture videos recorded before the start of the term, uh, such that uh, if for some reason I am not able to uh, record them during the term, you know, well, you know, I'm I'm so far ahead of the game, problem solved, um, and um, it works for me, I suppose. Uh, but I also recognize it's not for everybody, and I think. Um, I think I can admit freely that yes, I've been in plenty of situations where you know, I have cursed past me for not starting on something sooner uh, and causing a lot of stress or distress for present me. So yeah, probably it could have been completed if it was scheduled better, maybe, right? I mean, if you know, the system was completely busy uh, and there was no free time, then you know, maybe wanting to start it earlier wouldn't have been enough. Um, the same uh, question can also be asked uh, where we started the task, but you know, it's terminated partway through so that no additional effort is wasted on a task that we know cannot be completed. Uh, and it, it's yeah, kind of a good opportunity to ask ourselves again, could it have been completed if scheduled better? Um, what, you know, did we focus on the things that were most urgent? Um, because if, if we did, um, or if we didn't, uh, and you know, we didn't finish in time, um, that's a prioritization problem, right? Had we prioritized better, we would have been able to finish things uh, you know, on time, hypothetically. I mean, there's no guarantee uh, without knowing some more details, but maybe, maybe. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about real-time systems uh, in general, at least uh, a little bit more. Um, and real-time systems are considered to be unique, uh, at least according to the literature, uh, in five important areas. Uh, and we'll talk about each of them, although some of them will definitely be saving for a uh, later discussion. So the first one is determinism. The second, responsiveness. The third is uh, user control, but I think what they actually mean is administrator control, since regular users um, are probably not the ones uh, doing a lot of the configuration, etc reliability and fail soft operation. Um, those two are listed in the literature, as I say, as two separate points, but I think actually those should be considered together. Um, so I, if I were making the list, uh, I would combine them. Uh, and um, actually, because I make the uh, topic list for this course, I did combine them. Uh, and well, we'll talk about it when we get there. Okay, determinism. Um, so determinism is just based on the idea that operations are predictable. I spent some time already talking about the idea of why this is important uh, and you know, the relevance of um, having predictable uh, operations so that we can actually identify how long it's going to take to do something. Um, 
when there are multiple things happening concurrently, perfect determinism in a system is probably not going to happen. Um, that's just uh, the nature of randomness. And uh, uh, in a future course, if you're interested in it, you can talk about queuing theory uh, and you'll learn about you know, arrivals and uh, you know, random uh, processes and stuff like that. But for the most part, perfect determinism probably won't happen, but that's okay. We usually just need some guarantees. Uh, guarantees that you know, no matter how unlucky our timing is, we will start the task on time to successfully complete it. Right? Even for a system that only does one thing, um, if that thing is triggered by external factors, like you know, when we detect um, this particular configuration or when we identify um, this event has occurred, right? that's a little bit outside our control usually because you know, such events are uh, not, always, uh, not always gonna happen at the most convenient time. The important thing is just being sure that whatever happens, we have the ability to um, guarantee that we can accomplish all of our tasks on time. Non-determinism, though, isn't necessarily bad. Uh, and um, non-determinism exists in something like caching. Um, and I recently listened to a talk by um, one, of, one of our colleagues uh, in the ECE department, uh, and he was talking about uh, embedded systems, and um, they considered like having some systems uh, that don't have caches because it means that like, every operation takes a predictable amount of time. And the performance of such systems is bad, uh, and of course, nobody likes that. Um, but non-determinism uh, is not necessarily a problem um, because the presence of caching, if used correctly, it makes the worst case scenario no worse and makes the best case scenario much better. And that sounds like free performance to me, right? Um, Caching does mean that some requests take less time to service because, well, the data happens by chance to be in the cache of the CPU doing the work. And you could disable CPU caches or use a CPU that doesn't have one if you really want. Um, and it would ensure that all requests take the same amount of time. It's very fair, but I wouldn't call it ideal. Um, so I think this sounds like free performance to me, and I can't think easily of a reason why you would want to you know, disable caches um, as long as you understood sort of what is the worst case scenario uh, and you planned accordingly. Um, that seems okay to me, but um, once again, I don't, I don't know. Um, maybe you can think of something else. Maybe there is a system uh, that I have not thought of uh, and uh, that system would somehow actually uh, prefer sort of, um, non non determinism to be replaced with um, you know, uh, to be replaced with a system that's perfectly predictable. But I don't know. Next item in the list was responsiveness. Okay, so responsiveness sounds like it might be the same thing as determinism, but it's not. Um, and there is an important distinction um, to be made there. Um, and um, responsiveness is, um, well, not just the time it takes to respond, because um, determinism in how, is how long it takes before the operating system acknowledges a request for the interrupt. Uh, responsiveness is how long after acknowledgement it takes for the operating system to handle the event. So acknowledging the um, Acknowledging the request is one part of it, and that falls under the determinism. Um, but then responsiveness is once the system has become aware of it and has acknowledged, yes, I have this request, um, then the question is um, how long does it take before that request starts getting serviced? And that determines responsiveness. So um, it includes not only the time that it takes to, um, you know, uh, to run the interrupt handler, but also the time it takes to start the interrupt handler um, and has to consider also what is the possibility that the interrupt handler itself is interrupted by a different higher priority interrupt. Um, and I mean, that can happen. We talked about the idea of you know, interrupts and priorities amongst them in, uh, in, when we introduced the concept of interrupts. Um, it is concerning if it happens too much uh, and we have to have some amount of guarantee that you know, for a system to be appropriately responsive, um, that it is you know, not, there's not gonna be too many higher priority interrupts uh, that get in the way of the ones that we already have. And then there is administrator control. 
Um, an administrator control, as I say, is very different in a real-time system because it could fall into one of two categories. It could either be like much less or much, uh, much more. Um, your typical desktop operating system, you know, non-real-time system, lands somewhere in the middle um, in which you know, administrators have um, some amount of uh, control but not a huge amount um, and it's you know sensible defaults kind of thinking that you know the operating system designers uh, presume that they know best what is supposed to happen and you know that's what they want to happen and that's uh, not really changeable by the system administrators now in a real-time system you can go in one of two directions um, in the no control system um, the system takes no instructions from system administrators and it's run as it, as it has been programmed and configured um, without any human control, right? Um, users have no way to start new processes or tell the system to change priorities or, or anything like that. Um, and that's pretty reasonable, I would say, in certain contexts, right? Um, you should not be able to play solitaire on the fire suppression system. Like, that's not what it's for. Uh, and you know, tempting as it can be to you know, play Tetris on, on uh, you know, some Raspberry Pi or something. You know, again, if the Raspberry Pi is like focusing on some life or safety critical system, um, it would not be okay for uh, you know, everybody to be um, you know, telling it what to do, right? You know, using it to run general purpose stuff. Um, users don't really get that sort of say in it. On the other hand, in the more control scenario, um, system administrators get a huge amount of say uh, over what is supposed to happen, right? Um, the operating system itself has um, no way of knowing which tasks are real time and which, if any, are not, nor can it know uh, whether a given uh, real time task is soft, firm, or hard. Accordingly, administrators have to specify what it is, and they might even be able to make other choices like saying, okay, what is the scheduling algorithm? Right, um, that's not something you could normally choose um, in you know your typical uh, you know, Windows type system, because uh, yeah, I mean it's it's not up to you, and and why would it be? Um, but in uh, in a real time system, you might actually get a say in it. You might be able to say yes, um, this is this is what is most important. So why not? This is what I mean, right? Um, about uh, about either getting no control or a lot of control because yeah, ultimately uh, ultimately a lot of uh, system design comes down to how much do we trust the system administrator uh, and for some systems um, the correct answer is not at all uh, but for real-time operating system you get your choice okay um, and then we have um, you know reliability and fail soft uh, you know, sometimes you get the silver medal. Um, sorry about that. Um, and these topics aren't actually relevant uh, for scheduling at the moment, so I'm actually going to say we should defer this discussion until we get a little bit further down in the course. Um, and uh, I say this because, yes, there are actually some topics very specifically about this uh, in which we are going to, uh, which we're going to discuss the idea of uh, reliability and fail soft operation. For now, just take it as we do our best, even if it's not possible to succeed at all tasks, right? Um, the system tries its best to complete as many tasks as it can, trying to give priority to the hard real-time tasks. Okay, so scheduling, as you may imagine, is central uh, to a real-time system. Um, and, uh, you know, take the, take the big chair because scheduling determines whether we're gonna succeed or fail, all right? We got a little introduction as to why real-time systems are different um, and choosing a bad scheduling routine where important things are ignored guarantees failure, right? There's absolutely no way to succeed if we always you know, choose the least important tasks. Um, and uh, you can experience that sort of thing you know, in other contexts as well. Uh, you know, if you just sort of ignore, um, I don't know, the studying for the hardest course uh, in a term, um, you might feel good because you might say, well, you know, I'm making progress on all these other courses and that's important and, you know, I'm happy with that. Um, but in the end, the outcome isn't, isn't what you want, is it? Um, I mean, most likely it's not anyway. 
Um, so like choosing poorly, uh, assuming everything is a high priority doesn't work. Um, and the kind of scheduling algorithm that we've talked about so far doesn't meet our goals. Um, and so a lot of the scheduling algorithms that we've talked about thus far are just not adequate to the task because something like fairness um, is irrelevant. For a real-time system, the real objective is to ensure that all of the hard real-time tasks complete before their deadline and as many as possible of the soft real-time tasks. If the right conditions are present, then success is possible but is not guaranteed. Right? Even an optimal scheduling algorithm cannot make a task that takes 120 seconds complete in 90, um, nor can it find a way to complete 400 tasks per day when the system has a maximum throughput of 350. Uh, there's, there's no miracles here. Um, there's no way to uh, you know, change the laws of physics, uh, as, as Mr. Scott would say. Right? Uh, Captain, he says, I kind of changed the laws of physics. Um, and we're limited, right? The CPU that we have is the CPU we have, the system that we have is the system we have. Uh, and if we have the right algorithm, ideally, you know, if we haven't been asked to do the impossible, we should be able to succeed. Okay, so another thing that's very noteworthy is that none of the non-preemptive uh, scheduling algorithms would work for us. Right? The whole idea is based around prioritization of hard real-time tasks. Uh, and if one such task arrives while an unimportant task is in progress, it's not sensible for um, the high priority task to wait until the currently executing one gets blocked, voluntarily yields the CPU, or otherwise exits. Similarly, some routine that's based solely around time slices doesn't work. Um, since uh, it's not optimal to force the higher priority task to wait for up to one full time slice before it gets a turn. So the much more sensible approach is immediate preemption. When something comes in, we might drop what we're doing and deal with it if it is a higher priority than what we've been working on so far. Okay, um, here's a thought. Why should we do that? when we could just make time slices super, super small, right? You can make time slices effectively arbitrarily small. Um, why not? Okay, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that sometimes the speed of the response that we need is in the order of microseconds or milliseconds, and there's big consequences for being late. Uh, but also when we crank up the number of timer interrupts that we get for time slices, we spend more of the system's time handling those time slice interrupts uh, and less time actually doing the task that we've been asked to do. And that ends up being a problem because we are losing a significant proportion of CPU time to overhead. A reasonable proportion of overhead is to be expected, right? Um, you, know, you can't have you know, total chaos, no management, but at some point you have to, um, at some point you have to do something about it. Okay, so what kind of task are we talking about? Uh, and there's four kinds of tasks that are relevant to our discussion and they are fixed instance, periodic, aperiodic, and sporadic. And some of those sound kind of the same, but they're not. So we're going to have to break down each of them. Um, so fixed instance tasks, you know, one ping only, please. Um, this kind of task happens a, a fixed number of times, hence the name, usually only once. And this is like initialization or cleanup of the system. You know, when we boot up, we initialize the database, something like that. It is a task and it does run and the system does care about it. But those are not as interesting to our discussion as the other kinds, so we're really not gonna talk about it. You can't avoid having these tasks, you know, boot up the database, initialize it is important. Again, you're not doing it for fun, you're doing it because it serves a legitimate purpose uh, in terms of accomplishing the system's goals. Um, but the analysis that we want to consider is what happens at steady state at runtime. So after initialization, but before shutdown has been called um, because that's kind of the, the relevant period for discussion. So fun as it is to talk about these uh, one-off tasks um, and certainly like a one-off task going rogue can ruin your day. That's not what we're interested in. 
Uh, and then we have periodic tasks. Uh, and a periodic task is one that repeats at a regular interval. Uh, and periodic tasks are very common. Um, they are check a sensor, decode and display a frame of video to a screen, keep the Wi-Fi connection alive, something like that. Uh, and a periodic task is uh, considered to have two relevant attributes. And they are tau k, the period, um, which is like how often the task executes, uh, and ck, the worst case computation time, how long in the worst case this task might execute. Um, in real-time systems, we're usually pessimists uh, and we care about just the worst case scenario. Um, and we can calculate processor utilization for all periodic tasks you know, from k1 to n uh, as being ck divided by tau k. Okay, um, and if we only have one, then of course you know, it's just the ratio here, but realistically there are probably multiple periodic tasks in the system. Uh, and yeah, if we just do the math here, we can see what the utilization is like uh, for the system just looking at the periodic tasks. Okay, so if the utilization exceeds one, because it's a fraction here, it means the system is overloaded. There are too many periodic tasks, uh, and it means that we cannot guarantee that the system can execute all tasks and meet the deadlines. All right, yeah. as, as Scotty says, I'm giving her all she's got, Captain. There's just not enough resources available because the computation time is too much for the system that we have. If, however, utilization is at or below one, typically strictly below one, then it is possible to find a way to complete all the periodic tasks. Um, and in fact, we might choose to devise a schedule. Uh, and a schedule is to a greater extent um, what happens at University of Waterloo, um, where we create a fixed schedule of classes for a given term. Uh, and that means you know, every Monday, for example, from 8.30 to 9.50, a course, EC350, you can think of that as a task, takes place in a classroom, and the classroom is E75353, a resource. There's no way to have two classes in the same lecture hall at the same time. So if there are more requests for room reservation than rooms and time slots available, it means some requests cannot be accommodated. So in this sense, you know, a class is uh, to a greater or lesser extent a task, uh, and a room is to a greater or lesser extent a CPU. Um, and okay, you know, yes, the uh, uh, university has quite a lot of classrooms, but you know, I don't see why that's uh, now necessarily a problem. Um, but there's also a limited number of time slots, right? Um, you know, this course has three lecture hours per week, uh, and yeah, absent uh, you know, finding additional days of the week, there's just not, there's, there's no way to make more, right? Um, you know, do you want to build a new building? Like you can, but that costs millions of dollars and takes a few years. Uh, and that does increase capacity, um, but it's not something you can just snap your fingers and have, right? The problem that we face is that although a world in which all of the tasks are periodic and behave nicely is very orderly, the real world is not so accommodating most of the time. So we're going to have to deal with tasks that are not periodic. And even in you know, the UW scenario, right, sometimes we do have things happen. You know, a snow day happens and we have to like, reschedule classes for another day um, or um, you know, other, other contingency plan uh, is required or, or even just you know, a professor wants to have a help session so they want to book a room for that uh, or you know, there's a visiting lecture and they need a, a lecture hall so that they can talk about their research. Those things are not periodic tasks. Um, so we need to deal with things that look like that. Okay, so aperiodic tasks occur irregularly and there is no minimum interval between them. This makes it very difficult to make a guarantee that we will finish uh, any given aperiodic task before its next occurrence happens. So such tasks are very rarely hard real time. Um, and what we should expect to try to do here is that we schedule them on a best effort basis. We do not let them prevent a hard deadline task uh, from completing. Um, and if we expect to say you know, three requests per second, there is, uh, at least the math says, a 1.2% chance that eight or more requests occur all within the same second. Right? It's not impossible, it's unlikely, but it could happen. 
uh, and we have to acknowledge the fact that it is possible that we just get too many requests in too short a period of time. Sporadic tasks um, are aperiodic, but they do require meeting their deadlines, um, and we need a guarantee for that to be the case, such that there is a minimum time tau k between occurrences of the event. With that said, um, such sporadic tasks can still overload the system, right? If there's too many of them, we have to make decisions about what we're going to schedule and what's going to miss its deadline. Uh, and there aren't necessarily easy choices and there aren't even you know, strong rules that say, yes, uh, an, uh, a periodic task should always take priority over a sporadic task, right? One of the things that we will note is that you know, something's gonna miss its deadline. We likely probably don't bother to schedule it because, you know, well, it's gonna miss its deadline. What's the point? Okay, so um, I'm sure you have a number of answers to this for, uh, you know, from co-op terms, um, but for, from my experience, right, you know, where do task execution times come from, right? You know, we ask for estimates and then we treat them as deadlines. That's, that's how it works. And, you know, how long is it gonna take to, you know, complete this ticket, you know, once, you know, X story points. So we expect it's gonna be this many minutes. Um, that kind of thing always annoys me because I don't think those sorts of estimates are particularly useful. Uh, and yet, right? And yet management really wants them. Management really, really wants them because you know, they, I don't know, they like deadlines or you know, they want more certainty than can reasonably be expected. Um, such is life sometimes. Okay, but really, where do estimates uh, of task execution time come from? All right, uh, I said uh, this is a hard deadline task. It occurs periodically this often with tau k. Uh, period, uh, and it has CK um, execution time in the worst case. But how do I know that? Okay, well, like I said, we always assume the worst case scenario, um, but how do I estimate the worst case scenario? Okay, there's two ways that I think are relevant to do it. Um, one of them is source code analysis, and the other is empirical testing. Whatever strategy we choose, we're gonna overestimate the expected execution time or the expected amount of uh, tasks that we're gonna have to do. There are trade-offs to assuming that that is going to happen, right? It's possible that we calculate that we need you know, a much bigger CPU than we would otherwise need, right? Um, that might mean spending more money uh, or buying you know, a more powerful device, reducing battery life. Um, is it bad to have more capacity than you need? To some extent, no, right? Um, having a little bit of give in the system you know, uh, makes it so that you know, if our estimate is a little bit wrong or we're you know, a little less lucky than we had expected, you know, the world doesn't end. But how much capacity is the right amount of capacity to have? That's that's a difficult question to answer because it's, um, well, how much, how much extra money and, and such are you willing to spend? If you've ever been unfortunate enough to have a bad experience with an airline uh, where you know, one canceled flight results in a big cascade of cancellations, uh, lots of chaos for everyone trying to travel, it's partly caused by the fact that airlines plan their operations such that there's you know, zero to minimal additional capacity. And so minor disruptions can easily result in a cascade of problems that affect passengers whose trip is unrelated. That's how you end up with your Calgary to Vancouver flight canceled or delayed because it's snowing in Nova Scotia. Right? The flight crew that was supposed to travel from Halifax to Calgary didn't leave on time, and there's no extra flight crew just sitting in Calgary to take you to Vancouver. Thus, it doesn't matter that the weather in your departure and destination is sunny and clear. All right? because the, the crew that you need, the resources that you need are not available because, well, you know, there's some problem somewhere else, somewhere in the network. And this would be alleviated if there were extra capacity, right? If there was you know, more flight crews situated in more locations, uh, it would be possible for the airline to say, you know what, okay, you know, we have a backup flight crew just you know, sitting uh, at Calgary Airport. Um, we're going to um, assign them to your flight uh, and off you go. But 
flight crews cost money, right? You would be paying them to sit at the airport and you know, maybe the majority of days they don't have anything to do. And while I'm sure they probably appreciate getting paid for you know, less work, I don't know that, that that's ideal. Um, and you know, building an extra capacity has a cost to the airline and the airline is trying anyway to make money. Um, whether, whether or not they are successful is, is a different matter. Um, and air travel is important, but um, you know, frustrating as it is when your flight is canceled, um, it's not necessarily life and safety critical. So when we're designing an embedded system, particularly a real-time one, we might actually care quite a lot about putting in some extra capacity. But okay, um, let's talk about our actual estimation techniques for how we would identify um, the worst case execution time for a task. So one approach is through code analysis. And code analysis is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you look at the algorithm and you look at the possible inputs in the execution paths and you try to figure out how long the longest path could take because hypothetically, you can work out how long it takes to execute each statement. Yeah. That's hard, especially for like a complex instruction set uh, CPU and it becomes kind of difficult, um, a, a sufficiently complex program, but you can do it. Now, this will be an overestimate because it doesn't account for optimizations that go along with actually building and you know, running your program. Um, CPU pipelining, for example, uh, something you may have talked about um, in a hardware course, uh, is based around the idea of you know, the CPU is trying to do multiple operations in progress because like fetching and decoding of two different instructions could happen in parallel, that sort of thing. It also ignores stuff like compiler optimizations where you know, the compiler can look at the code that you wrote and give you a better version of that. Um, it, it has been sufficiently long. I haven't plugged EC459 recently, so um, I'm gonna plug it again here and tell you we'll talk about compiler optimizations in that course. Um, and you may have talked about them a little bit in a compilers course as well, uh, or maybe you will in the future if you're interested in taking one. So that's kind of an, an overestimate, but that's okay. Now, a lot of the things that we do fairly frequently in a non-real-time system will still make it difficult to actually produce a reasonable estimate for what is the worst case execution time. Um, if we follow like the NASA JPL guidelines uh, for C coding, we'll notice that they have some important rules, you know, no recursion and no go to. Do I have to uh, mark this YouTube video as having a swear word now? Um, uh, loops must have a fixed bound, so you know, there's no infinite loop, you know, while true with a break statement or something like that. There has to be you know, a fixed uh, loop bound, so we know the maximum number of iterations uh, that the loop could take. Um, and no dynamic memory allocation, right? Um, at least after initialization. In addition to each of these things being stuff that's easy to get wrong in the sense that you know, probably we've uncovered a lot of problems with like Helgrind uh, and Valgrind around uh, you, these particular issues, they also make it difficult to, um, to estimate if we have any of those, how long a particular function is going to take. Um, and in particular, the restrictions around like recursion um, and um, fixed loop iterations make sense um, because it's hard to estimate how long a function will take if we don't know how many times the loop is gonna run. Um, and you know, with allocation of memory, with you know, numerous other system calls, right? Like we don't know how long it takes for malloc or free to carry out your request. It's usually pretty fast but we're interested in the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario um, you know, may, be, may be actually pretty dynamically bad, right? Because malloc uh, may have to scour all of memory to find you a free block in the size that you want. Uh, and then that, that could take an arbitrary amount of time depending on the size of memory you have. Remember how we talked about the binary buddy routine? That's a thought. And then there is empirical observation as another approach for how you could estimate the runtime. And this one I think is a little bit easier to convince you that this would actually work, right? For a, a simple program, you might be able to do a, a detailed enough analysis uh, of the code and you might be able to say, okay, I think this is how long it's going to take. 
um, for a complex program, I mean, you can you can get there, right? You know, how do you how do you walk uh, you know from Toronto to Montreal, you know, one step at a time? Uh, you can have an estimate for each function, and you can map out which functions call which other functions, and you can build it up, but that's hard. Empirical observation sounds kind of plausible. Um, and so if you already have uh, version n of the system and you want to build version n plus one, it might be easy to look at existing data and extrapolate. So you say, all right, well, you know, this new system, you know, it has a CPU that's X percent more powerful. So we expect that it should reduce um, the uh, execution time of tasks by some fraction of X. Uh, and that's probably a reasonable way of estimating. It gets you uh, a ballpark figure. Uh, and uh, is, is it perfect? No, but it's a start. Otherwise, um, you have to, um, well, simulate. Uh, and how to effectively do a simulation is, well, it could be a course of its own. Uh, but suffice it to say, um, if your simulation makes incorrect uh, assumptions or is otherwise constructed poorly, um, the data will be useless or misleading. Uh, and simulation will be one of those two things. You know, either it will be representative of the system uh, or it will be misleading. Now, suppose that you actually prepare a simulation and you run it. Let's imagine it is good enough for our purposes. Uh, you presumably get some distribution of um, run times. Uh, I really don't want to get too far into the statistical math of it. Um, but it is possible to estimate using known mathematical techniques uh, the worst case runtime with a confidence interval. Uh, and when we talk about confidence interval, we might say the maximum time is t with 99% confidence based on the standard deviation. You might want to push it to 99.99% confidence if that would be appropriate for your system. Um, it does give you a worst case estimate that you are willing to use. Uh, and you, know, you can take this to sort of an arbitrary degree, right? Because at the end of the day, you can say the task will take infinite time and then you'll be correct. Even if it does actually take infinite time, you will be correct that you know, the task completed in less than infinite time. The problem is that a task that takes infinite time can never be scheduled because what's the point will never finish. So you have to decide and to a greater extent use engineering judgment how much confidence you need, uh, what is you know, the maximum upper bound, how much extra padding do you want to put on it, you know, how much extra um, capacity are you going to uh, build into your system to accommodate worst case scenarios, right? How, how bad is the worst worst case scenario that you need to handle? Okay, so now that we have some understanding of real-time systems, like how to classify tasks in them, and even you know, some idea about how to estimate how long a task will take in the worst case scenario, we're ready to go on to the idea of actually scheduling them. So in the next topic, we're going to talk about some real-time scheduling algorithms.